so we're going to be in the book Gospel of Luke today. Um, for those of you who might not know, in the Bible there are four different biographies of Jesus written by four different people, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. We're in the third one, Gospel of Luke. And I'm going to read uh, from chapter 7. This is a story about Jesus. Uh, one of the Pharisees, the Pharisees are a religious leader, uh, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She began behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. Jesus said, A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he cancelled the debts for both of them. Now, which of them do you think would love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one whom he cancelled the greater debt. And Jesus he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head of oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began saying amongst themselves, Who is this to even forgive sin? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. I'm going to talk about faith this morning. I call it grappling with faith because you've got to have the word grapple in the title, I always think. So every, every time you hear me speak, it's going to have a grappling with something, okay? Uh, I was in a conversation with a guy last weekend and I was sitting in a park talking with him and uh, uh, he asked me what I did. I said I was a, a Christian, a pastor, and that opened up a conversation. And at some point in the conversation, he said to me, well, I'm not a believer, but my wife, she has faith. I thought, it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, what did he mean by that? Well, he kind of meant, uh, I, I'm not a, I, don't, I don't have a religious conviction, but my wife, she believes in something spiritual or religious of some sort. So he makes this distinction between himself and her. She has faith, but I don't. Now, what else did he mean? Well, there's a, a, a kind of an idea around faith which says that there's a difference between being logical and rational and having faith. Faith is something, is believing in something without proof, some might think. And the, the way we get to that is that um, it's sort of kind of saying um, faith is blind. It's, it's, it's without evidence, it's without proof. But on the other hand, some people uh, will believe in scientific method or logic. There's rationality about it. And so they set up this distinction between having faith and not having faith. And I was thinking about this, and um, it occurred to me that actually. We all have faith. In fact, whether you're religious or not, you take leaps of faith every single day. Do you know this? I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I booked a holiday in about a month. Go out to Queensland. Can't wait. Beach, sand, surf. It's going to be awesome. Well, I have to get there, right? I have to get on a plane to do it. Now, when I get into that plane, I'm going to take a leap of faith. Faith that it won't go up and then down very hard and kill me. That's the faith leap I'm going to take, right? It's a leap of faith. I don't know for sure that it's, that it's going to stay up in the air. I don't know that. And yet, I'm going to do it. In fact, thousands and thousands of people every day take that same leap. They get into airplanes. Now, now why is that? Well, it's definitely faith because there's no absolute proof. But people will still do it. Why? Because they have evidence. Now, I'm not an aerospace engineer or anything close to being that. But there are certain things that I know that will help me to get into the airplane. One is that I trust that the plane is made well, that the people who made it 
knew what they were doing when they made it. And they took the necessary precautions too. I, I trust the airline safety record. But so far they've got done pretty well in keeping planes up in the sky and making sure they land safely. And so I trust the airline. I trust the captain. I trust that he's well trained and that he knows how to fly the plane. <laughs> I trust the, the, the stewards and stewardesses that they're trained in case of an emergency, that in case something does go wrong. So with all that in the back of my mind, I will walk up those steps into that plane. I have faith. I take a leap of faith. If faith simply means, at, at the barest bone, barest level, trusting something with our lives, then we all have faith. The question then is not so much do I have faith, but what do I have faith in? Because here's what else I think. I think that we all build our lives on something. We trust that something is going to give our lives meaning and value. It's going to make them worth living, right? We have faith in something. We trust in something to give our lives those things. When the Bible talks about faith, what it means is it's trying to persuade you, persuade us, to have faith in Jesus Christ. It's trying to say that He is worth trusting your life to above and beyond everything else. In our story today with the woman and Jesus, um, I want to start at the very end. He says to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. The question I want to ask ourselves is this, what is this faith that has saved her and how did she get it? What is the faith that has saved her and how did she get it? To answer the question, I want to um, talk about three things that show the, what sort of faith that she had. Okay? The right attitude, the right evidence, and the right person. Okay? I'll say it again, the right attitude, the right evidence, right person. Let's jump, jump straight in with the right attitude. Uh, so what we have is, is Jesus having dinner with this religious leader. He's a, a pastor, a minister, you might say. Um, and while in the middle of the dinner, this woman walks in through the door. Uh, and this woman has a reputation, let's just say. We don't know exactly what, but she's notorious. She's known around the place. She's a woman of the city, so to speak. She's desperate, she's destitute, she's despised, and yet she boldly, just and really trespassing, walks right into this house of this respected, good, moral, clean leader of the church of that day. And with her, she's got a jar of expensive ointment, kind of perfumed ointment, very expensive. And what's crazy about this is she walks in, and before anyone can do a thing, she's unplugged the, the jar, she's on her knees, and she's anointing the feet of Jesus. This incredible act. And it's, it's, it's incredible for two reasons. One, it's an act of a menial servant. The job of anointing feet is like the, the gutter job. It's the worst thing. The, the lowest slave, the lowest servant has to do that job. So it's an act of incredible servanthood, incredible humility to do this for Jesus. But it's made even more incredible because it's also an act of incredible generosity. Because this, this bottle she's got is probably worth... I don't know, months of her wage. It's incredibly expensive. So what does this mean? It means that as she comes to Jesus, she comes with a certain attitude, and that attitude is humility. She knows three things. She knows that she needs help. That's clear. She's walked into a situation which she would never dream of doing unless she was desperate. She knows that she's broken. She knows her life isn't put together. The Pharisee Simon, he thinks his life is put together, but he's wrong. She knows it's not put together right. She knows that it's not going well. She needs help. That's the first thing. Secondly, she knows that she can't help herself. If she could help herself, she wouldn't be in this house. She'd be doing whatever it is that would help her. But she knows that she needs help and that someone has to help her. And she knows that that person is Jesus. And thirdly, she knows that the one who can help her is worth everything to her. It's, Jesus gets her very best. Not only does he, she bend down and wash his feet, but she uses probably the most expensive item that she possesses to do it. The point that we get from this is that true faith always leads to true humility. Okay? 
So that's the first thing she has. She has the right attitude. The second thing she has is the right evidence. Uh, it's clear that this woman just hasn't stumbled in off the street. She knows Jesus. She's probably followed him for a while. She's heard his teachings. She's seen his miracles. She's hung out with him. She, she's, she may not have met him personally, but she's been in the general area. She knows she's been in the crowd as Jesus has lived his life and done his ministry. What that means is that her faith isn't blind. She's not just randomly here. She's coming because she's been impacted by Jesus. She's learned something from him. Her, his life has changed hers in some way that caused her to want to come and give everything to him. When we roll at Renegade, for those who do roll here, uh, we, we take leaps of faith. I love rolling with Big Luke. You know Big Luke? Dr. Luke, Osteo, to the stars. Uh, love rolling with Big Luke. Now, Luke's huge. It's like double my size and double my technique. Absolutely. When I roll with him, I am absolutely aware that he has the capacity to tear my arm off. I know he can do it. It's not a matter of if. It's, it's, it's a matter of he can do it. He's crazy technical. He's crazy strong. And here's the thing. It's, it's interesting. I love rolling with him. I, I, I will seek him out. I, I want to have a, a grapple with him on it when we train together. Why is that? Well, the reason is because I have faith in him to some extent. And that faith is built on evidence. Why am I happy to roll with him? Because I know him. He's my mate. He's my osteo, so he knows, he, you know, he, he knows how my body works. He's shown me that he can limit his strength and that he'll let go when I tap. I know that. I've, I've seen it so many times. In other words, my faith in him is based on my relationship, a relationship with him built over time, bit by bit by bit. My point is that faith in Jesus just doesn't happen like that. It happens as you gain a relationship with him. You learn him, you trust him, you, you, you read the Bible and you find out that he's loving and kind and compassionate, that he's actually perfect, that he reveals God himself, and everything that is good is in Jesus. And you see what he's done. Uh, that he's given hope to broken people. That he's willing to suffer and die on our behalf. That he rose again proving that he's God. That he's, he promises to give us new life and hope beyond death. Trust in Jesus happens after careful investigation about who he is and what he's done. It's not blind faith. It's reasonable faith. It's based on evidence. Some people think that faith or, or belief is about finding the perfect equation. If we can only just get this one bit of scientific evidence and this bit of proof and put them together, somehow that will help and make me believe in something. Well, actually, it's probably not the case. There's something actually far better than a perfect equation, and that's finding the perfect person. Meeting the perfect person builds not only logical certainty about something, but relational trust. Christianity is about knowing Jesus so well that you trust him. That doesn't mean that all doubts are taken away. Real faith has, includes doubt, and it includes doubt that you work through over time. But it's not about finding the logical proof. It's about finding the perfect person to trust in and to give your life to. So we've got the right attitude, it's humility, the right evidence, building that trust, and finally, it's about finding, what I just said, the right person. Faith is about finding the right person. This woman comes to Jesus and she ex ex exhibits this uh, combination of evidence and humility. It's a wonderful picture of faith that is true and deep and humble. But it's not worth anything unless that faith is placed in someone or something that can actually help. Faith that's placed in something that can't help you isn't worth the paper it's printed on. If Jesus just replied to her, well, great, thanks, woman, thanks very much, great, well, I'll see you at church next week, well, that, that's no help to anyone. What we see is that faith in Jesus is the best news for this woman. 
Not because the situation's miraculously changed, not because she suddenly gets a million dollars or gets a car, not because she even gets repaid for the expensive perfume that she's given out. What happens is she gets something far more valuable. And it comes in this final sentence Jesus gives, so simple. She, he says to her, your sins are forgiven, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Faith in Jesus leads to something of immense value, something far greater than money or possessions. It leads to inward spiritual healing. It means that this woman's, Jesus' uh, interest in this woman is, is not an outward situation, it's a heart. He sees in her a wounded heart, someone, someone that's broken deeply on the inside. His statement, your sins are forgiven, is saying to her, I see your brokenness, I see where you've gone wrong, I see how desperately you need help, and I'm going to heal you, and I'm going to help you, I'm going to restore you. Your sins are forgiven. The reality is that it seems from what Jesus says that she's actually already experienced this forgiveness. This is not her getting it for the first time. This is actually her having already got it and now acting out of it. Jesus says, you see that? Jesus says to the Pharisee, the religious leader, you see the love of this woman? This is the, this is the life of love that comes from experiencing true spiritual healing and forgiveness at the deepest level. She's already been transformed. Her great love reveals a new inward reality. Now, I think I said at the beginning that we all have faith. The question is, what do we have faith in? We all hope that that faith in something will lead to a good life, that will lead to a life of fulfillment and satisfaction. And so we try to put faith in different things we think are going to get that thing. We might put faith in relationships, you know, that will lead to a life of belonging and love and acceptance. Or we might put faith in career, getting a life of respect and status. Or maybe we'll put, life, uh, put faith into a sport, getting a life of achievement and success and gold medals. Maybe we'll put faith in money, a life of pleasure and comfort. Maybe even we'll put faith in being a good moral person, having a life of inner contentment and happiness through being good. The problem is that so often our faith in those things gets shattered because it turns out that they're not solid foundations. In relationships we get dumped. In careers we might lose our jobs or miss a promotion. In sport we get injured or we might lose a fight. In money, we, we, it might, money so easily lost or wasted. Or it might be that we're just constantly dissatisfied looking for that little bit more, that little bit more, that little bit more. Or even being a good person, we might actually realize one day as we search our own hearts that we're not as good as we think we are. That we've all lied and cheated and stolen. We're just good at putting faces over it. The quest in the, of human life is, is to find something worth having 